really looking forward to today. I'm going to meet one of my oldest chums, a man called Lars Felt, who's responsible for all survival training within the Swedish military. Just a few kilometres up this lake, he's got a course on at the moment. A few years ago, the Swedish army realised that recruits raised in the cities no longer knew how to take care of themselves in the wilds. So Lars was ordered to organise survival training. The Arctic training he runs is second to none in the world. This course is for soldiers who want to become survival instructors, and it's tough. They'll be on their own for five days without food or supplies. The shelter they're making is called a Quincy. You can't build igloos here because the snow is too powdery. So you make a big pile of snow and then hollow it out using sticks to ensure the thicknesses of the wall are even. When you uncover the tip from inside, you stop digging. To complete the course, the soldiers must pass a crucial test. They must be able to make fire in under 60 seconds. That's not easy when you're hungry and your hands are frozen. The ability to light a fire is obviously important in the Arctic, but fire can do more than just keep you warm, it can get you rescued. This special fire instantly sends dense smoke high into the air, attracting the attention of rescue planes overhead. jet passes you in seconds, so a properly prepared signal fire can make the difference between life and death. Letting rescuers know where you are is one thing, getting rescued is another, and in the Arctic that can take a long time. In 1991 a Canadian Air Force transport plane crashed near the North Pole with 18 people on board. The rescuers knew exactly where the plane had come down, but it took two days to get to them. In that time, they had to survive in temperatures as low as minus 70 degrees centigrade. The plane was on a routine supply mission to an airbase at Alert, less than 500 miles from the North Pole. Most of the passengers were from the military, but also on board was Bob Thompson, manager of the civilian-run store at the base. I would go up there every three or four months just to uh, see how things were going and make sure that they had the items they needed. and. Uh, and things like that. As the plane made its final approach to alert, the crew made a fatal misjudgment and clipped the top of a hill. I was waiting for the landing gear to come down and then it was just a big, uh, grinding, very loud, very violent noise. Somebody, you know, close to me said something like, you know, what's happening? And I, I just sort of blurt, we're crashing. <laughs> I was still belted in and, and remembered sort of rushing air and then um, <clears throat> quite a sudden stop. I was uh, uh, lying in the snow in, in uh, complete darkness. Rescuers knew within minutes where the plane had crashed, but there were no helicopters at alert and the crash site proved to be impossible to reach by land. Bob was trapped in mangled bits of wreckage with a broken back and totally reliant on the surviving air crew making him some shelter. We were covered up and I guess some wreckage had had been uh, found that was put behind us as a, a windbreak and there was some kind of a tarpaulin or, or it was some kind of a heavy material that was put over. As the hours ticked by a ferocious storm blew up bringing wind chill and unimaginable cold. 
Unable to move, Bob was freezing to death despite his makeshift shelter. It was almost the feeling of the tingling feeling you have when your feet have been frozen and that thawing, burning, tingling sensation. I, I was feeling that in my arms and in my hands and, and it would come and go and it would almost run up to my shoulders and then it would subside again, but I would have that burning, tingling feeling. It was 32 hours before the first rescuers arrived to find 13 of the original 18 people on board still alive. The pilot who'd done so much to save Bob had died of hypothermia just hours before, but somehow Bob had survived. I just thought either I was going to get out of there or I wasn't, and there was not a lot I could do about it. So it was a situation where um, you know, I, if I toughed it out, there was a chance. Bob lost two toes from his left foot and his right leg to frostbite. But eight years on, he now owns and runs his own supermarket. Customers come, boy, it's cold out there. Uh, yeah, sometimes I kind of laugh to myself a little bit. It's, uh, <clears throat> no, that, that would be balmy by, by our, uh, our standards up, up in alert. Um, but uh, it's, it's just, uh, uh, it's hard to believe uh, how, how cold that was. Bob's sheer determination to live was crucial to his survival. You can never underestimate the importance of a positive mental attitude. Maybe it depends on, on your other knowledge, but it could be about 80% the strength to live and the will to live and not give up and endurance and all that. So it's very, very important. How important is a sense of humor? Very important. Even if I cannot sing, it's good to sing. <laughs> Dr. Anders Holström is the Swedish Army's advisor on frostbite and the effects of extreme cold on the human body. The cold makes you stress hormones, and the stress hormones make you produce more urine than, than indoors. And you have to keep up with that drinking a lot. Because if you get dehydrated, the blood volume goes down and the circulation goes down, and uh, perhaps your, even your uh, ability to work goes down. So drinking is one of the vital things to, to think of. In the Swedish army, getting frostbite is a court martial offense. How, how do you thaw frostbite? Well, you take your hand, put it on a place where, where, it's, where it's white, and, uh, and uh, you just get the heat from the hand, and then it, the white spot is going away. But is there a problem if you have the hand, you have to put it inside your clothing like that, or if your feet, you have to put it in, in your uh, uh, comrade's armpit. Is it dangerous to heat your hands too quickly? Well, you, if you heat it with body, body uh, uh, heat, it's no, no difficult. But don't heat it on the fire, because you can't uh, know how, how uh, strong the fire is. It can be really pretty, but of course the sunshine combined with all this snow can sometimes cause another problem, snow blindness. If you lose your goggles or your sunglasses, you will be in real trouble. In those situations, you may have to improvise some sort of blinker using bark, cloth, or even carved out of wood like this, Inuit style. And they really work. Shelter, fire and water help to save the energy you've got in your body and use it efficiently. But to really stay warm, you've got to keep feeding your body's machine. And of course, that means being able to find food. The lakes up here provide good fishing. The problem is how to break through a metre of ice. To do that, I need a tool that can often be found in wilderness cabins. That's what I'm looking for, an auger. That makes drilling through the ice real easy. 